Did the Federal Reserve wait too long to cut interest rates? Will they have to double the size of the anticipated cut to make up for being late to the party? Just a few of the questions being asked given the state of today's job market. Corey Cantega, head of economics for America, is at LinkedIn here with answers. Fortunately for us, Corey, good to see you. So was the Fed late? Will we see a 50-point cut to calm the fears? Well, there's definitely concerns about whether the Fed was late or not, but I don't think we'll be able to know that right now. It's going to take some time for that to be able to show. If we do find ourselves seeing sharper increases in unemployment, then there may be an argument that monetary policy is a little bit behind the curve. But right now, it's just too early to tell. Uh, the talk around here is if there's a 50-point cut, the markets would then suffer because they would think, uh-oh, the Fed must know something we don't. What do you make of that theory? I think that's right. I think the Fed has been pretty clear about signaling gradual cuts, like a 25 basis point cut. I think they're going to stick to that. They want to provide stability and reliability in terms of the signals that they're giving to the market. So I would be really surprised if they went for a 50 basis point cut. We'd really have to see something bad in the jobs report for that to even be on the table. We've seen some numbers come in, including ADP data and job openings, the lowest since January 2021. What's the significance of that? And how important is Friday's jobs number? Well, the job openings comes from the JOLTS report. That's the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. Particularly, the job opening series is quite volatile. So from month to month, it'll jump up, it'll jump down. I think what's significant about that number is that now we're below 8 million. So we've been pretty much above 8 million you know, for the last few years, and now we're below 8 million in terms of job openings. And when there are fewer job openings, that means there's probably going to be more slowdown in hiring. There's probably less opportunities for people to add to that payroll number for job gains. So if we start to see that payroll number slow, that's going to be a signal to the Fed that, you know what, maybe we're at full employment or possibly slipping below that. Sure. And, and Corey, there's so much data out there. Let's just say someone comes up to you on the street or contacts you on LinkedIn and says, hey, look, how would you describe the state of the economy? What would you answer? And what data really defines that for you? Well, I think it's important right now, given the mixed signals we're getting from the data, to distinguish yeah. between the state of the economy and the state of the labor market. Right now, the economy is actually on track to grow above 2 percent, around 2.5 percent, according to the Atlanta Fed's now cast. So the economy looks to be doing pretty well. It looks to be that economic activity is continuing to expand. The labor market is still holding up, but there's more fragility in the labor market now than what we saw a year ago. So right now, payrolls have kind of slowed. We see unemployment's above 4 percent, still low, but above 4 percent, which is a meaningful benchmark for a lot of folks. So it is tougher in the job market if you're looking for a job. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily translate to economic activity slowing, but the job market has become increasingly fragile and a tougher job market, especially for job seekers. Yeah, it really, to me, almost depends on what political party uh, you stand with, your perspective on the economy, which is just the times in which we live. So let's dive inside the labor market. What fields would you say are currently healthy and are adding consistent jobs? So the field that's really adding consistent jobs and is very healthy is healthcare and social services. We've seen jobs report after jobs report. Well, healthcare and social services has added the bulk of jobs in terms of just the plurality. And if you look even at with the revisions that we got for bench for the preliminary benchmark revisions in August, it skews even more heavily to, towards healthcare and social services. Government is another sector that's consistently adding jobs. That's going to be state and local government, not necessarily federal. People talk about the size of the federal government, but there are a lot more state and local employees than federal employees. So state and local government has added a lot of jobs over the over the year. That seems to be starting to slow a bit. We saw in jolts uh, yesterday that the job openings in that sector have come down a bit. But those two areas have really been supporting job growth. Mm -hmm. Another area that's been supporting job growth very heavily has been leisure and hospitality. They have fully recovered from the pandemic for the most part. We saw an ADP this morning that there were only a, about, you know, a, we were sort of in that 11,000 range for them. Uh, it, so they're, they're not really adding a ton of jobs anymore. So things have slowed down for leisure and hospitality just because they fully recovered from the pandemic. Flip side, where are the struggles? So the struggles right now are in the places that have been struggling 
you know, along this entire time, places that have been highly exposed to this high interest rate environment. So professional and business services. In particular, we saw with the benchmark revisions that it seemed like, yes, there had been some growth, some tepid growth in professional and business services. But once we got those benchmark revisions, it seems the professional and business services actually contracted over the over the last year, looking back from March to March 2024, 2023. You know, tech has also been an area that struggled. What we've actually seen on LinkedIn is that tech has been leading the way towards stabilizing. So hiring is slow in tech, but it's but it's actually started to trend kind of flat. Things in tech look much better than what they do overall in terms of how things are trending, even though hiring is slow there. Are we yet seeing jobs killed, replaced by artificial intelligence? And if not, when do you see that wave beginning? Well, with every new technology, it actually takes a long time to see any impact. We haven't really noticed any impact in terms of jobs being replaced by AI. There are increasingly jobs that are saying, you know what, employers are saying, we want workers who have AI aptitude or AI literacy skills so that then when they, when they come in, they can help us upskill and do things more productively. But beyond that, there has been no signs of any major job losses as a result of generative AI being adopted. And the adoption at the company level actually seems quite contained. According to the U.S. Census, only about 5% of companies are using and only about 7% plan to use in the next six months. So are you not buying those dire predictions of hundreds of millions of jobs at some point being replaced by AI? Well, you know, there are chances that anything could happen, right? An asteroid could hit the Earth. But (laughs) I'm... Focused. I'm not going to focus so much on tail events. As economists, I know we're very bad at predicting tail events, so I tend to stay away from that as an economist. Uh, but generally speaking, it does take time to start to see um, job losses. And sometimes it's not to say, oh, employers are just going to lay off workers. Yeah. What will happen is workers will leave. There will be attrition. We have a lot of people aging out of the workforce, and they just won't replace them. They may replace them with other roles. Indeed. So what you do see are, are patterns, shifts, and, and for quite some time, job changers drove the, the great resignation, as we called it, which has now given way to what I understand you're calling the big stay or what economists call the big stay. What is that? Well, I would say there are a lot of folks who are using this term big stay, great stay, and it's not necessarily clear what they mean. What I think they mean is that, you know, People are not quitting as much as we would expect them to, or people are quitting at a rate that is historically low. And it turns out that that's not actually true. The average quit rate that we saw yesterday is actually above the average over the last quarter century. So we are not quitting our jobs at a significantly slower pace where it necessarily merits the title of a big stay. So let me just let me just clear this up. We're pumping the brakes on this whole big stay. It is not backed up by the data. There are some areas where it does seem to be like, it does seem like quits are, you know, they're pretty low. So if you look at professional services, if you look at information, which has a lot of tech jobs, media jobs, it does seem like quits are low and they're they're not historically low over, compared to the last 25 years, but they're still pretty low. But everywhere else, quits are not even close to historical lows. In a lot of industries, they're over 50%. The, the quit rate is over 50% higher than the historical lows we saw after the Great Recession. So some are just using some clickbait there, perhaps. One thing we do know, some very interesting data came out from the Wall Street Journal yesterday. Since 2020, more than 9 million people have emigrated here to the U.S. That's illegally and legally since 2020. That is more than three times the prior four years What are the implications of that on our labor market? Well, one thing to remember is that in the prior four years, we had a global pandemic and borders were shut down. Immigration collapsed, especially for folks who were moving from less developed economies to more developed economies. So really, a lot of what we're seeing right now is some catch up just in terms of the number of people coming back into these coming into these countries, coming back into those labor markets. So we have to distinguish between what's actually a catch up and sort of what's, uh, you know, a new anomaly. There's a lot of catch up to do in terms of immigration from the labor market. And there are a lot of countries. The U.S. is one of them that are aging and we have people leaving the workforce and the pandemic accelerated that. And we need workers actually in the workforce to replace a lot of those workers who are leaving. So it's always just important to keep in mind the broader context when we're talking about immigration and the impact on the labor market. In fact, we actually need a lot of immigrants to fill certain roles. 
Yeah, it's a dirty little secret, isn't it? We actually need even illegal immigration here in the U.S. I want to come full circle back to where we started this conversation, which is about Jerome Powell and the Fed two weeks out. The narrative being and your prediction being a 25 point cut. What could really dramatically change that narrative, do you think? So I think the Fed has signaled that they're willing to react to if they see job conditions deteriorating quickly. So a sharp rise in the unemployment rate, for example, unemployment jumping above four and a half percent or a sharp downturn in terms of payrolls added. So that number being negative or almost zero, it would really take a strong event like that to change what the Fed plans to do. The Fed understands that these data points fluctuate from month to month. Sometimes you'll see a strong number. Sometimes you'll see a weak number. And you can't make too much out of a single data point. You have to look at the direction the data is trending. That's what the Fed is monitoring. From their point of view, it looks like the labor market's holding up. We're also seeing that on our platform on LinkedIn. Things are slow, but they are holding up. And so the Fed isn't going to change their plans unless they see something that looks particularly extreme. Stuck the landing as always, my friend Corey Cantanga, head of economics for the Americas at LinkedIn, the only social media platform that matters to most of us these days. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome back to the headline here on Cheddar, where just about every day the biggest story and issue weighing on the wallets and minds of Americans is inflation. Just about everything we buy these days costs dramatically more than it did just a few years ago. Is that, as Kamala Harris has suggested, price gouging? Let's discuss with the editor of The War on Prices, how popular misconceptions about inflation, prices, and value create bad policy. Ryan Bourne. Ryan, good to see you, my friend. Thanks so much. Uh, your book, it debunks popular myths about inflation. What is the biggest myth? Well, the biggest myth really is that inflation is driven by a host of malevolent actors and price gouging businesses across the economy. Uh, inflation, you know, really results from a fundamental imbalance between the amount of money in circulation being spent and the amount of production uh, going on in terms of goods and services uh, by businesses. And the simple truth is that uh, most of the inflation, the vast majority, I estimate around 80% of the kind of excess inflation we've seen uh, since 2020 has really been driven by uh, expansionary macroeconomic stimulus, monetary and fiscal stimulus here in Washington, D.C. But it, of course, suits the politicians to deflect blame for that onto uh, corporations because uh, they're ultimately the ones that change the sticker prices on their products. So just to back up, for, for the, the audience that's just trying to consume all that, are you saying it's strictly government spending and the Federal Reserve that causes inflation? Yes. I mean, primarily, it's uh, the responsibility lies with the Federal Reserve. We saw a huge expansion in the money supply, the amount of money in circulation uh, from 2020 through to uh, late 2021. And that takes some time to filter out through uh, the economy. And you add to that the fact that federal government is borrowing vast amounts, in effect, dropping money into people's uh, accounts through all that pandemic stimulus spending. And there's simply much more money in circulation uh, being spent on goods and services. And when you have that big increase in demand for products, and the economy isn't producing more or isn't able to produce that much more, uh, that increase in demand drives up prices across the economy. And that takes some time to play out. So that's why we've seen kind of elevated inflation over the past three years. So is it fair to blame the Biden administration's spending for our current inflation? I think certainly it was a component of what we saw. Of course, there was uh, vast amounts of spending under President Trump uh, yeah. during the first year of the pandemic as well. And of course, the Federal Reserve's responsibility is to look at what the Congress and the president is doing and try to adjust monetary policy to keep that level of spending on a relatively even keel. So I think we can uh, assign some blame all around. Uh, I think Trump probably engaged in too much stimulus spending in 2020. But certainly by the time we got to 2021, the economy was reopening. I think it was really unforgivable that the Biden administration lathered on all that spending through the American Rescue Plan, 1.9 trillion mm. uh, at a time when the economy didn't really need it. So certainly we can attribute some blame to the Biden administration, but a lot of that inflation was baked in through the result of the monetary expansions we'd seen in the early stages of the pandemic. 
Yeah, the lines have certainly been blurred in terms of government spending. Both parties have overspent for, for decades now. Should the Federal Reserve has, have raised interest rates sooner? Yes, the Federal Reserve should have raised interest rates sooner. Uh, I think a lot of people got kind of confused by what was going on. Uh, if you remember during the pandemic, with everything being shut down, uh, that caused a lot of supply chain problems. And when the economy reopened and we saw all that demand surge, I think a lot of people looked at, you know, ports being clogged up and certain businesses not being able to serve demand, shortages of workers and thought, you know, these are temporary supply problems. And once those supply problems iron themselves out, we'll see prices fall back again. So they thought this was kind of a, they called it transitory inflation. It was very temporary. And as a result of uh, things going on as we came out of the pandemic, I think that was a fundamental uh, misconception. And actually what we recognized as, as uh, time went on is that actually uh, that inflation was much more permanent. The price level increase was much more permanent. And that was just simply because, it, in fact, you know, what we saw wasn't being driven by temporary supply problems. The supply problems were the result of excessive spending. And that was putting huge strain on ports. It was putting huge strain on businesses because they simply could not keep up with the level of demand being uh, driven by excess spending in the economy. Transitory, one of those words we, we hear that Jerome Powell probably would like to take back at this point. So let's come for a circle back to where we started. How much do retailers, how much control do they have over prices? Well, I mean, in the in the technical sense, I guess any retailer is free to set whatever price they like. In reality, if they set a price that's so divorced uh, from what people are willing to pay or their customers, uh, or, or sorry, their competitors uh, are charging, then they'll go out of business. They either make severe losses um, or they or, or they lose all of their uh, custom in time. So really what they're able to charge is determined by the broader market conditions of supply and demand, uh, how much consumers are willing and able to spend on their products and whether competitors are there to undercut them. And um, and so this really gets to kind of this idea of price gouging because, yeah, a company could try on selling a higher price than their kind of cost dictate in the short term. But if they do that, other companies have huge incentives to try and undercut them and steal their business. So this idea that at an economy wide level, price gouging can, dr can drive inflation is, is really a, another misconception because uh, there's big incentives for other companies to undercut businesses that are trying it on with their customers. But as you look at it, are there examples where there are industries, companies that are actively price gouging? We have to be very careful with the terminology on price gouging. Price gouging assumes that they kind of charge in excessive amounts, kind of unfair amounts or whatever. But ultimately, for businesses to be able to charge higher prices on a sustainable basis, customers have to be willing and able to pay those higher prices. And uh, the reason that customers were able to pay those higher prices is simply because there was more money floating around. And so um, what looks like price gouging sometimes is just the actual result of excessive stimulus uh, in the economy. And as I say, the ultimate responsibility for that falls on the Federal Reserve, who are supposed to keep inflation under control. Former President Trump may be studying this ahead of the uh, September 10 debate. So when people hear Jerome Powell and economists say we're getting under inflation under control, they don't see it. They don't feel it. Will we see prices ever return to where they were pre-pandemic? And do you see inflation under control? Well, inflation measures the increase in the general price level across the economy from one year to the next. So it's certainly true that inflation has come down. Uh, but what that does not mean is that prices are going to return to where they were uh, back in 2019, 2020. Uh, the rate at which prices are going up has slowed, and that means inflation has slowed. Uh, but we've seen a permanent increase in prices as a result of that monetary mismanagement. Groceries are currently 21% above uh, where they were uh, in 2021. And unfortunately, that's not going to change. You know, in time, as people's uh, wages go up with economic growth, uh, we may see a period in which, uh, relative to wages, prices become more affordable again. Uh, but for now, you know, for the foreseeable future, when people go into the grocery stores, they are going to be paying those higher prices, um, and, and that's a reality. Now, would it would it be benefit us if we got prices all the way back down to 2019? 
no, uh, because uh, the only way that the Federal Reserve and, the, and Congress could get there would be to really collapse demand, and that could risk very high uh, unemployment. Um, what we really need here going forward is to try and keep inflation at target and to allow economic growth to to grow people's wage packets so that uh, food and other essential goods become more affordable relative to wages again. Nice to cut through the political noise and get the facts here. Our thanks to Ryan Bourne from the Cato Institute. The book is called The War on Prices. You can get it wherever books are sold. Thanks so much, Ryan. Appreciate that. Coming up, the business headlines you may have missed this week, including where Elon Musk wants to take X. Stay with us. Welcome back to the headline. Some tough news for the jobs market. U.S. job openings fell in July to their lowest level since January 2021, signaling a cooling labor market. The drop lower than expected and reflects a slowdown in demand for workers. The unemployment rate rose to 4.3 percent and job gains were weaker than anticipated. The Federal Reserve is expected to cut interest rates at their next meeting in two weeks. Disney has pulled its ABC stations, ESPN, and other cable networks from DirecTV after failing to reach a new distribution deal. The move impacting more than 11 million satellite subscribers as major sporting events like the U.S. Open and the NFL season kicks off. The dispute centers on DirecTV's demands for more flexible, affordable channel bundles. However, Disney insists on maintaining rates consistent with other providers and is accusing DirecTV of seeking unreasonable discounts. The first NFL game on ESPN is Monday night. The Justice Department has issued subpoenas to NVIDIA in an antitrust investigation. The focus is on the company's dominance in AI processors. The probe examines whether NVIDIA's practices, including its recent acquisitions, unfairly restrict competition and limit customers' ability to choose other suppliers. NVIDIA asserts that its market leadership stems from their superior performance of its products. Kamala Harris is proposing a tax break for startups. It's intended to help business owners offset costs. The Democratic presidential nominee will increase the small business tax deduction from $5,000 to $50,000 for new companies if elected. While it's not clear how her administration would pay for the proposal, Harris's campaign says the amount is to cover the $40,000 on average it costs to start a small business and that filers could claim all or part of the deduction until they say a return on profits. X, formerly known as Twitter, is coming to a TV near you. Elon Musk's social media platform has launched a smart TV app called XTV to push the platform's shift to video content. Available on Google Play, Amazon, and LG app stores, the app lets users watch videos and live stream on their TVs by signing into their X account. The move is part of Musk's broader goal to make X an all-encompassing platform, though it's uncertain if it will change users' video watching habits from mobile to TV. Thanks for catching this week's edition of The Headline. Don't go away. More Cheddar up next.